my name is Pat and this is my vlog summarizing 2020. I like to do this in some form every year as a way of thinking back over the year and just it, it's nice to reflect, to gather your thoughts, to look for patterns, and sometimes just to, to record these thoughts for later analysis for anybody else who might be interested. Um, I produce a lot of documents in my life as I think about various things and sometimes I share them, sometimes I don't. And a lot of the time, like I'll just share them on Twitter. So if you don't spot it, uh, then you'll probably miss it. Um, sometimes it'll just be planning for some events. Um, sometimes it's just taking notes on things that, uh, that I need to keep track of for myself. But I think it's nice to have a public reflection on, uh, on the way that a year went. And I actually, I probably do this twice, once on my birthday and, uh, and once near the end of the year. And I know that we're not quite at the end of the year yet, and there might still be some surprising events in the year. Um, I'm hoping that there won't be, because at least the two that I imagine might come up are pretty negative, one of which would be personal, um, and that if my remaining cat develops enough health issues, then she might no longer be with me. Or there could be some more nonsense from President Trump's uh, continued unwillingness to accept that he lost the election. But in general, uh, I think we're, we're near enough the end of the year that, that I, I, I'm hoping that neither of those happens and I don't, I, certain, I don't expect other things to come up. So let's, let's get into it. 2020 has been a pretty strange year and I've been thinking a lot about democracy and its failings. Some years back I had I had a, a friend in my life. Uh, it was a kind of a difficult friendship because he was kind of anti-philosophy. He didn't handle very well when people don't define things the same way as he did. A little bit of weird gaslighty kind of things like everybody agrees with my set of definitions. The only reason anybody would ever talk about definitions is they're being weird or they're trying to manipulate things. I, as somebody who's into philosophy, I found that hard to deal with. But in any case, uh, he, we had a conversation about elections and about what percentage of people really buy into the things that we often think are universal and we tell ourselves that they're universal and i suspected that that it was larger than we thought and that um that there's a, a there's a lot of stuff going on beneath the surface in our democracy maybe in any democracy where a lot of people feel powerless and they have views that are hard to reconcile with those of others. And so society kind of needs to convince them that they need to, uh, they're either going to need to uh, walk the walk and do a great job at convincing a lot of other people to join their perspective or just accept that they're not going to have power. And that's not an easy thing because when people get frustrated enough, uh, then they're going to support radical, dangerous things and might decide to do violence. And a lot of democracy is based on this idea of rather than fighting each other, we take on ourselves the responsibility to convince a lot of our fellow citizens and try and win elections to get what we want. Sometimes you have to win multiple elections because it's... Uh, our government by design is not that pliable that all you have to do is win one election and everything changes. Uh, the, the existence of the Supreme Court is an example where it represents a long-term consensus on various legal matters because of the way that appointments to the Supreme Court work. In any case, um, I suspected that there's a lot of people who don't buy into things that we really would probably like to believe 
a lot of people buy into like the idea that uh honor is not something worth killing over uh the ideas uh, of free speech uh the ideas of, uh, just a lot of ideals that have dominated the way that our society has worked for decades or in some cases centuries are things that don't actually have that much agreement maybe they have 50 percent agreement maybe they have even 30 percent but nobody has managed to get enough momentum to change them uh, he didn't like this idea he found it i think a little scary but i nonetheless i think that there's something to it i i think for a long period of time there have been a lot of things where there's been among the people who care there's a fairly small percentage who supported the idea and a lot of other people were just willing to go along with it or didn't care enough against it to rise up and then there's a group of people that were, were strongly against it, but they're fringe and they're always uh, kept out of, uh, out of any political influence. And I think this recent election has, unfortunately, some of this frustration might have come to a head. Uh, some of it can come from a politician who's willing to go and dig around in the electorate for people who uh, who have been left out and decide, well, if you sign on with me, I will uh, completely change your world. And it's a lie, but it's a very dangerous lie because it gets those people's hopes up and it's hard to get them to go back to accepting that they're not gonna have a lot of influence unless they can really change a lot of minds. Like that's that's really a rough lesson and so they'll They'll fight for you. They'll uh, they'll fight for anybody, any politician who's willing to tell them that. Uh, and they might not care a lot about democratic ideals because maybe they never did. So if you rummage around in democracy's attic, particularly when you're running against somebody who never was that popular to begin with and felt entitled to her party's nomination. Uh, yes, I'm talking about Hillary. Um, it can produce surprising results as a lot of ugly, dark thoughts suddenly come out into the open. And where, where this has led us is to something very close to a constitutional crisis. And this isn't quite resolved as of right now. I mean, legally it mostly is, and that Trump, uh, he lost the election uh, in in the sense that certainly by the by the normal standards of the way things normally work uh he did not get enough states to go over the mark and biden did by a reasonable margin not quite the landslide that democrats hoped for but it was uh good enough to do the job and uh and it was not actually that close but the problem is that Trump is not somebody who has the psychological makeup where he can accept defeat. He's a poor sportsman. He's willing to burn democracy on the way out because of his um, psychological faults. And so we're, we're near a constitutional crisis and uh, he has pressured election officials to override um, the results of uh, of the democracy and to change the way things normally work by, again, rummaging around in democracy's attic for the weird legal stuff that normally doesn't matter. And unfortunately, this means that there's possibly the need to remove a lame duck president by force if he refuses to step down, if he tries exploring any of these martial law ideas and is not shut down by the establishment. And that's scary. It's not something that would do our country any good. And his continued conspiracy theories are also not doing our country very good because his diehard supporters are not getting the message that you lost. If you want to, uh, if you want to have influence, then convince a lot more people and try and win future elections. That's the message that you're supposed to have in democracy when you lose. Um, so the question is, how did we get here? Were there signs? I think that there is a large cultural divide and it's partly due to news media bubbles. 
the commentary side of Fox News did a lot to enable this. And Fox, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's healthy that any news orgs have tried to do both commentary and news. I think each of them damages the other and it would be better for a network to commit to one or the other rather than do both. Um, but Fox made a bubble and it, uh, the bubble eventually detached from the American mainstream and it wasn't helped by the, the president who was eager to have this detached because it would let him say whatever he wanted without ever being checked. And so we're, we've seen things develop to the extent that now even Fox is unwilling to follow the radicalization that Trump has grabbed onto and intensified until we're seeing more fringe networks occupying more prominent spaces, which is, again, quite dangerous. Um, so I, I think part of this is also that it's not enough to win elections. And uh, it's important for both political parties to show up and engage with people in states that they might never win. Uh, this is good civics um, because uh, you, you don't want either party to conflate uh, political shifts with cultural shifts. And you don't want uh, large portions of society to feel completely non-vested in the changes that are happening because that makes people scared. It, it, uh, and people being scared is partly, it's erosive to the trust needed for a pluralist democracy to function. And yes, there are also some people on my side, meaning liberals, not Democrats. Uh, I am not a Democrat. I don't think I've ever been registered as a Democrat. Um, I think I've only actually ever been registered as a libertarian, but that was a long time ago, back when I was libertarian in philosophy. I've changed a lot since, since. the label would not fit me at all now. Um, but as an independent liberal, I still recognize that there are, there are other flavors of liberalism out there that are, in my view, reprehensible, namely the woke, who mostly moralize and rarely try to convince, and often who don't except pluralism. The DSA sort in particular are not good at pluralism. They have little patience for convincing. They just want to win and they'll bulldoze anybody uh, aside who is in the way. And democracy, you don't want to be keen to lose, but you have to accept the need to convince, the need to show up to arguments, at least show up and don't show up to, to teach show up to, uh, to argue, to debate. Um, so the, the, the woke, they scare people as much as the scary people on the right, uh, the, um, scare people like me, the, the proud boys and, and that lot. And people often vote over who they hate or who they fear more. And so along the way, they forget the value of pluralism because every election feels like something that they must win or they're absolutely screwed. Now, people believe this to various degrees. You'll find some people who literally seem to think that uh, that the Soviet Union is rolling in and it's about to round up conservatives and kill them all. And this is obviously false, but some people seem to get really, really scared of this kind of thing. Now. I hope that they'll, when they see this not happening and when they see just a fairly boring uh, democratic administration, they chill out and I'm, uh, it would be nice. But other people have more, they have concerns that the woke cultural shifts will continue if they let Democrats uh, win. And I, I think that this is an error because the Democrats are not as a whole committed to this kind of stuff. Uh, there are some fringe people who are, but they're small in number, and Biden is, is not among them. When I say woke, I am talking about people who are particularly invested in the cultural changes, not necessarily all that invested in policy, uh, except perhaps on policy relating to cultural things like free speech, 
versus the, the kind of people who think that it should be illegal to dead name or that it's harassing to not call people by their preferred gender uh, pronouns or whatever. Uh, and yeah, we, we need to squash those, uh, those people who are trying to restrict free speech, but it's not the mainstream Democrats who are dangerous in this front. Um, so yeah, it's, it, but our democracy is pretty unhealthy now. It's troubling and we're also culturally not doing too well because of all of this woke encroachment on uh on technocratic ideals actually that's maybe a little bit more of like radicals um general radicals on the left who seem to have a hatred of technocracy but the wokes with their cultural stuff they're they're a problem too but they're they're not the only problem there are problems uh, on the right and the left on both cultural and uh, policy matters and we need to be really careful not to let the worst voices win on either side. I don't think that it can amount to treating every election as an existential struggle though and that is probably where we are right now. Uh, I'm hoping in the next 10 years, I'm hoping at least over my lifetime that I see the polarization shift, I, that we give up on a lot of all this uh, inclusive language stuff and all that and that uh, the militias and stuff that they go away but it's hard to know 2020 was a um on the health side was a little bit of a rough year for me i started the year with two cats and i ended the year i'm ending the year or at least getting near the end of the year with one cat my cat tortfeasor, who I had for 19 years, uh, he developed heart problems fairly early in the year and started having strokes and slowly like he would get into cycles where he could walk and then not walk anymore. And I carried him around for several months and tried to anticipate where he would need to go next would hold him up when he was eating, would carry him to the litter box and then back out again. It was really painful. Uh, Long-term companions like that, they come to feel like they're part of us. And, and so when you lose a, a long-term pet, you lose a part of who you are. And also just having somebody to love and care for whether it's a human or a cat, it, it's a big deal for a lot of us. It, it's not the same in magnitude, but it has a lot of the same flavor of when parents lose their children. And that's devastating. And Torfeaser, he, he was additionally just a, a cat that I really got along well with. I, I mean, I'm in my early 40s. I've had a number of pets over the years of a variety of species um, uh, and grew up with pets. Torfeaser, he was a cat, but he was a lot like a dog. Um, he always wanted attention. He never mind being grabbed or long snuggles. If you scooped him up and brought him into your arms and fell asleep, he would usually stay there. And sometimes like he would just drape himself over you. Uh, I was much closer to him than my other cat, Beefalo. And it was also like having him gone isn't the only thing. I had to see him in decline. And uh, and then that was finished by taking him to the vet to be put down. And that was just an emotionally really sharp end. It's tough to like have the, a vet take your, your cat away and bring them back with an IV and say like, when I press this plunger, he'll be out within 20 seconds and that'll be it and just saying goodbye and then walking home with an empty carrier like that's it's rough for 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 probably about a week afterwards i just randomly uh, cried it was yeah it's so losing tort fuser was tough and so i'm left with my other cat beefalo and 
my relationship with her is evolving as she's now my only pet. Um, I never got along with her nearly as well. She's kind of a, a spoiled cat. Um, she's very picky with when she wants to be petted and how she wants to be petted. She's not as friendly. Um, and she also she has her own health problems that she's developed over the last two years. She has a lump growing in her side that's a mostly benign tumor, uh, but it keeps on very slowly getting bigger. And it can't be removed because the vet isn't sure that she would survive uh, the anesthesia or all of the uh, chemo type stuff afterwards. So we're, we're not treating it. And she's having thyroid issues that are giving her un, uh, unending thirst. And, but I still, like, I am getting closer to her. Uh, I'm learning better how to try and uh, keep her happy. But it's also scary to think about her no longer being uh, around because she's, like Tortfuser was, she's 19. And so I can't count on her being around in a year or two. And the idea of being alone, that's just not, not something that, uh, it would be bad. Now, there were some other things in my health over the year. Um, I had a kidney stone and it was one of the most painful things I've experienced. It's right up there with the worst of my migraines. I've dealt with migraines for a lot of my life and uh, this, it felt like my guts were twisted and in terrible agony. I've had two episodes with it, a few ER visits, and eventually it, in the second visit they found out that it was the same stone as the first one. And I got an appointment and had it um, ultrasounded out of me with non-invasive surgery. After that, actually a few days after that, uh, everything was good. Uh, and I didn't feel any more pain or discomfort. It was just gone. It's useful to have experiences like this to remind us that life isn't something that has unchanging circumstances. There's a kind of this natural personal mythology on this topic, like many other topics, that exaggerates the sameness of things, leads us to a certain fatalism. Or like in more mystical people sometimes you see the belief that all medical issues can be solved with a diet uh, with a healthy diet and clean living and that's not how it works not that having a healthy diet and clean living is bad advice but you can't prevent all issues or solve all issues with that um, but uh, it also made me think a little bit about what it would have been like having a kidney stone maybe 200 years ago or 100 years ago when they didn't have the ability to see or remove these things uh, safely or at all. So I would just would have had chronic pain and uh, difficulties. Uh, I don't know if I, uh, if this would have killed me or, or something at some point, but it, it would have been awful living with this for a longer period of time. Um, uh, but on the migraine front, I've been dealing with and resigned to them being a frequent and unpredictable part of my life for decades. But this year that changed. Um, I finally found a medication, got, got a new neurologist, and I, I've tried many triptans before for migraines, and none of them had worked. But maybe uh, a few years ago, was it one or two years ago, something like that, um, I got an MRI and we found the spot on my neck that was causing uh, the migraines. There were some nerves being pinched. But we also found that rezotriptan can tame most of that, so uh, most of the pain, so that uh, within an hour, most of my mig migraines can be stopped rather than giving me 8 to 40 hours of pain. It's not a definite. I still sometimes get the longer ones because it doesn't always work, but it usually does. Now, I still have neck problems that there's a particular spot in, in the back of my head as it meets the neck where uh, there's always pain associated with the migraine. And uh, I mean, whenever I'm starting to get one and I'm needing to be more careful with that area, but it's nice 
that this year I think I have a medication and I have a much more full understanding of how to deal with these things. Now we tried Botox in those areas, but it didn't work. Um, it's unfortunate because Botox might have been a more lasting, entirely preventative measure, but it just uh, it did not work in that area and it did not prevent the migraines. But the resatriptan, it, that's good enough. Uh, now, fin finally, as a last health thing, I had COVID-19 in late March and my mom's side of the family has had excellent immune systems and rarely gets sick. I inherited this and I have rarely known illness over my life. My three sisters have not been so lucky and they actually do get sick a pretty normal amount. But, um, but I, I've just usually been able to count on it. Uh, if I get an infection of, of some kind, I'll get over it really quickly if I'll even get it at all. Um, so I got it, got COVID in late March, shortly before my office closed. And so there were a few days, I think in the week after where I had um, weird pain uh, that felt like it was pain in my lungs or, or like the inside of my back. It was a really weird sensation. I'd never felt it before. I've not felt it since. And I had a fever and I survived it and it was unpleasant. It, it lasted a few days. I was also pretty tired but it never got life-threatening and I never went to the house, uh, to the hospital. That coworker wasn't so lucky and suffered pretty severely from it. Um, in May, as uh, antibody tests hit New York City uh, and the, the mayor's office was tweeting, hey, we have these things, nobody's using them, went and got the tests and that confirmed that I had it. And it, that kind of told me what those weird few days were. Um, it, it admittedly came two months later, but it was good to know. So that, that's been my health over 2020. Um, gaming wise, it's been a pretty good year. I got a new gaming rig. Um, every, about every five years, I'll buy a new fairly expensive gaming rig. And I, uh, I've been buying it from a company called I Buy Power. Uh, and I got a very nice piece of hardware. Uh, it did show up only mostly stable, and it's still not 100% stable. It showed up with one bad dim, which I are made. But very occasionally the system still hangs or the display goes out for a bit. It's pretty rare, but it happens. Um, but I've been having a great time with it. Uh, the, 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 uh, it has a GTX, uh, I mean, sorry, RTX 3090. And so there are some games that use ray, the ray tracing features and they look really, really nice. Minecraft actually looks surprisingly nice with ray tracing turned on. A VR rig is on the way. Actually, it's currently waiting for me in, uh, in my office at work and I need to swing by and pick it up. I ordered an HP VR uh, rig. I didn't want to order the Oculus because of their weird, you need to have a Facebook account thing that they did. I, it's unfortunate that Facebook bought them and imposed that stupid requirement. Um, and so there have been some games that I've been enjoying over the last year. Uh, again, Minecraft, uh, it's been a great addition to my life. I play it sporadically and that's fine. Um, I play alone in my own survival world so far. I have a lot of long-term projects, some of, some of which are probably pretty pointless or things that I could do very quickly in creative mode. But the slow labor to do what I want is something I enjoy, and it's nice just knowing that I can build basically anything, or at least build a lot of things if I put the time into it. Past houses and apartments, my own little cities, uh, lakes, places I've been, uh, whatever I like. It's just, it's a very nice, chill, creative game. And, and I mean, even calling it a game is kind of, I guess it's a game, but it's, it's more of a sandbox kind of thing than anything else in the same way that maybe Planet Simulator is is a game. Uh, there's Cyberpunk 2077, which uh, I recently finished. It has great characters whom I came to actually feel things for, and that's nice. And in the case of Judy, uh, I actually felt some attraction for her, although, again, this is the weird habit I have of often being attracted to lesbian chic. I'm unsure if my being bisexual has anything to do with it or not, 
Um, anyhow, V, the main character, her illness also kind of mirrored some of my migraine experiences. Uh, unpredictable, debilitating uh, problems. And also, just due to some of the darker days of my past, I went for the bad ending first, which was kind of weird and definitely was pulling on some of my experiences and emotions and so it felt a little bit like Life is Strange, um, which was another game that I enjoyed a few years back, but I don't think I could play again because it was like really emotionally heavy for me. Um, but after I went uh, with the dark ending, I went with another ending that explored one of the optional but often present bits of cyberpunk, which is really a surprisingly philosophical genre at times, which are reflections on the good life you might see it as being kind of a Nietzschean reflection on and maybe rejection of the idea of eudaimonia. Um, I might have to do another video on this topic at some point because there's a lot to say and but there would be a lot of background to lay down on the meaning of the terms. Uh, but either way, the idea of the, the nomad gangs that you 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 roll with in in this particular ending it's neat to have games that have multiple entirely different endings but uh the idea that they present of of these fa families uh is compelling and though even though i'm i'm probably not morally cut out for the cyberpunk world it's not something that i would enjoy existing in but there's a lot that's compelling about those mobile tribes and Given my fondness for the Institute in Fallout 4, it, it's, it was a little surprising to me that they made this compelling to me, but they did. Um, so another game, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Uh, I, I loved it. Um, but like Cyberpunk 2077, it had some serious issues with bugs. Um, but it's a it's another beautiful game, uh, really interesting characters, and I've been thinking a lot about how to judge the character of Loki in the game, who you could easily see as either very sympathetic or very not sympathetic, uh, just based on some fairly different frameworks that you might bring to the table. And he also advances the larger plot of the series in interesting ways. I'm not a big Assassin's Creed buff, um, but I've enjoyed uh, the, some of the last few games. I didn't enjoy the pirate one, but, uh, but the two ones after that uh, I enjoyed a lot. Um, the game also had some nice uh, music from a Nordic musician by the name of Einar Selvik, who's a neo-pagan and who possibly brings a lot more personal meaning in his composition to, uh, uh, to the pieces. I haven't really looked into it to see if he shares a lot of the weird politics that neo-pagans often have, but then as an atheist I often find a lot of weird and icky things in a lot of faiths from Buddhism to Christianity to Islam. Um, uh, but, uh, but Einar wrote a piece called Skull Crusher, which is this beautiful piece with fantastic vocals that I've been playing a lot since. Um, there's there's a game called uh, Immortal is it called Immortals what, what uh, Immortals Phoenix Rising, that's what it's called. Um, that I've been playing a little bit. It's a very kind of cartoony cousin to Assassin's Creed Valhalla, with some of the style of Sunset Overdrive, uh, and uh, also a lot of Zelda-like puzzles. That uh, it's enjoyable. It's surprisingly hard. And it's unclear whether the latter parts of the game will be as interesting as the first part, but it's cute. And I'm not like uh, diving in for really long sessions in the way that I did Assassin's Creed Valhalla, but it's a nice game to casually engage with. Um, so there's another game called Hades that's another game that you want to play for just a little bit. It's an action game with some mild RPG elements, uh, has some really great music, and just gently drips little bits of plot between the busy, action-y uh, gameplay. Um, and there, there's a song called In the Blood that, that I find um, uh, particularly nice. It's, it's about family. 
Um, much earlier this year, I was playing the PC port of Horizon Zero Dawn. I don't have a PlayStation, so I don't. I didn't have any way of playing the game earlier. It's a little bit older, and the PC release was very, very buggy when uh, uh, when released. But it's also a very good game, um, and it has interesting lore. I didn't quite finish it because I the game kept on crashing near the end. Not at predictable points, but it just, uh, you could launch it and then play it for, for maybe 20 minutes and it would crash. Um, I should go back to it and, and wrap it up because I think I was fairly near the end when I stopped playing. Um, I'm hoping the sequel also makes it to PC uh, because there's probably a lot of console exclusive games out there that I'm interested in, but I'm not willing to buy the console for it. Largely based on the reasoning that you buy a new console every few years and you don't want to keep them all connected to your TV or whatever. But if you buy a PC, you're buying it probably for good. Or at least for a fairly long uh, period of time. And you're going to be able to play it 10, 15 years later. Probably no problems. Probably. Um, now, Watch Dogs Legion. I didn't have as positive an experience with it. It was interesting for a little bit, but the mechanics were just too shallow. They felt even shallower than the versions before it. And the politics were childish, ham-fisted, and irritating. Uh, and eventually I just stopped playing. Uh, it wasn't really any bugs that led me there. Just it, the game had come to be a mix of annoying and boring. And for a game about hacking, Cyberpunk 2077, did it much better and had much better gameplay everywhere else. So that, that that's a thumbs down on that game. There was also a game, Shantae and the Seven Sirens, which wasn't as good as its predecessor, which was a masterpiece, but it was still amusing. Um, I, I, I liked it. There have been a few other games that I've probably forgotten, but those are the games. Uh, on the book front, I've been looking for a new tablet to read books on because I, I, reading books on tablet is now my preferred reading method, but it's a little annoying that Android has de-emphasized tablets. So it's hard to come by any new hardware running any recent Android uh, OS version. And it, as frustrated as I am with Google generally, I'm unwilling to use Apple or Microsoft's uh, tablets. And I want color, so the uh, Amazon non-Android Kindle devices are not a great option for me. Um, so I'm using uh, this older tablet that now has pretty mediocre battery life because of its age. I think it's a Nexus 9 or... Um, but I've been on a sci-fi kick. Recently I've been working my way through uh, Greg Egan's hard sci-fi. Um, but there's been some fantasy. I like the, the Baron of Magister Valley by Stephen Brust. It's part of a really large series of works set in a particular world, and that familiarity now makes it a pretty easy read for me. Uh, the weird flowery language uh, that are used in some parts of the series uh, takes some time to, to get used to, but eventually you stop seeing it. Um, uh, it more in nonfiction, I've been reading about jazz standards, starting with Ted uh, Gioia's uh, work. And uh, also some music theory, uh, notably Guarino Mazzola. Uh, I've been starting with some of his works. I've been reading some political and policy analysis works. A lot of it on the, on desired reforms to the to our legal system after Trump leaves. Finding ways to deal with cultural issues, uh, both right wing populism and left wing woke uh, radicals. The latter thing has also been a frequent uh, topic of thought and I'm hoping to find ways to diminish wokes and radicals and get cosmopolitan technocratic liberalism back in the spotlight just because I don't want to live in a woke or radical society. And I've been enjoying some uh, art books uh, that have been put out for video games and for some other things. Um, now, I've been collecting contents that I want to read or consume far faster than I've been consuming it. This is challenging because across all these different types of media, from current events, magazines, YouTube videos, and interesting websites, I have over 100 tabs open on my phone. I have well over 200 things in my watch later list on YouTube. I have a lot of uh, kin uh, books on Kindle. 
that I'd like to read. And so this is probably months or years worth of consumption. And I consume a lot, but I seem to add things to consume at least moderately faster than I consume uh, because it takes far less time and is far less picky in terms of the uh, mood that I'm in to just add something for later than to actually consume it because I need to have the time, I need to be in the right mood and so on. And I have a lot of high quality streams for finding things. And I don't want to raise my standards because they're already quite high and there are many things I just don't want to miss out on. Um, I've been thinking, I've still been thinking about content for sprawling MMOs, but I think I've matured my thoughts on this to the point where I can put it down as a topic just to, to go through it in brief, it's hard, apart from games like Minecraft that generate nearly everything randomly and are deep only in a certain sense, to produce a sprawling world that doesn't feel empty. It's hard and expensive. Say you, uh, the voice actors are expensive. Good stories are hard and doing an, any story well and handling all the branching paths in it and the open world philosophy is hard. So the effort needed to do even a mediocre job is staggering, and a good job is quite expensive and nearly impossible. In theory, you could open the doors to fans, but they tend to produce crap work. Uh, and yes, they, they really do. Most people write things that are easily recognizable as fan work, from having Nancy Sue's to just having lots of other easy tropes. A lot of people grew up on Dragon Ball Z, which really is, it's kind of bad fan fiction that unfortunately got a budget and some publicity behind it where nothing is worth talking about unless it's the most something uh, and things that have little nuance or little appreciation for philosophy you uh, you don't end up having a lot of better uh, written games have things that are that have like the the subtle flavors of good tea in them but fan works rarely have that and so what you really want is things that make you think rather than amples. Now, maybe you could find a broader community of such people, semi, semi amateur seiyus and storytellers, but then you have to worry, would this devalue the work of professionals? Uh, would it cut them off from making a living? Is that fair? Even if you could somehow manage to get a, a large body like this. Now, in theory, if, if you could get speech synthesis good enough, then you could take the seiyu out of the picture entirely. This will probably happen sometime in the future, maybe the near future. If we could do that for storytellers, that's much further in the future, I suspect. It's possible, I guess. And if we go the cognitive style of doing this, uh, then we'd be reading those AIs some Joseph Campbell. But maybe we'd go uh, through a machine learning approach instead. I, I don't know how possible that is. Um, you also have some restricted media like roguelike simplify things by not having content of the resolution that it needs say you but you still need storytellers if you want stories either way i don't think there'll be any real solutions for any of this soon for most kinds of games and things like witcher 3 which did an admirable job at exploring a lot of fairy ta uh, tales european fairy tales they'll be rarities i've been thinking about uh covid's and what it says about us as a nation. It's been depressing seeing how badly the U.S. has dealt with this, partly because the administration had a parade of errors on nearly every decision point, um, but also because people were not willing to make temporary sacrifices to their lifestyle. Uh, this topic needs a lot further thought. Uh, there are uh, issues like suburbanites who think that because they've withdrawn from the world, uh, in not living in cities in order to do what they like, uh, that they they really do get to do what they like and nobody gets to tell them what to do. Um, so this might be another reason to eliminate the tax and transit incentives that create suburbs, um, but that's a longer term issue. So I've been watching the RT numbers and death counts across the world and trying to understand what countries do well and what countries do badly and looking at the policies that amount to them doing badly as well as the cultural elements uh, badly or better um i've been following the science as best i can it helps to work in the sciences have a good biology background 
and to have donated to a medical research institute that does donors video conferences so that I can catch up on the latest um, research and advice. And I've been watching better politicians, uh, in particular Mike DeWine of Ohio, deal with it more competently than most states. Cuomo of New York State has done mostly okay. Some people blame him for some nursing home policies, uh, but I think that they're mistaken uh, in that criticism. Uh, happy to go into it if, if anybody's curious, but I, I don't blame him at all for those policies. Just, just to go into it in brief, uh, he required that, that nursing homes take people who have been released from hospitals back. Uh, now they, they were allowed to keep them in separate facilities and encouraged uh, to do so. But this was a measure to prevent uh, elderly nursing, uh, nursing home uh, residents from being made homeless by COVID-19. You really don't want to make people homeless over this and the hospitals were not going to be able to keep them. Um, but some people have been pretending that there was an, a magically easy, better solution and attacking Cuomo, uh, Cuomo for that. Now, my personal life uh, over the last year has not been that great, but there's been some adjustment to the way that I look at the world. I, I had another person who I had a pretty strong crush on walk out of my life without my ever telling them about it but it wouldn't have been productive. They were already taken. And this has happened many times over the decades and it sucks every time. But when somebody is taken, perhaps it's for the best. For the people who weren't taken, I probably should have said something. I have a lot of regrets on this front, but in this case, it simplifies things. And it's nice not to have irrational hopes leading to irrational disappointments and irrational anger for, for stupid hopes not being substantiated. Um, the loneliness of this year has been pretty difficult and I'm hoping once COVID ends to have the energy to remedy that for good and make myself start dating again. I have little experience in this, but this year has made clear what my current path will lead me to if I don't change things. I've been thinking about buying a house well outside the city, but I might need to change jobs to make that workable if I want to work one to two days a week remotely, which I think I would want to do. Um, depending uh, on whether there are policy changes in my workplace, uh, I might need to do that. And so I'm thinking about that, what that would mean and if I'm ready for a career change yet, if that's what I would have to do to make that uh, idea a reality. Because ideally spending three to four days a week outside the city um, and then uh, the rest in, a, uh, in an even smaller apartment with a smaller footprint that's what I'm aiming for. Now, community-wise, some online community stuff has been better since COVID. Um, it's made it really easy to attend things uh, when I don't need to show up in person. There's no travel time involved. There's no hassle of travel involved. It also helps a bit when you're not a very social person, when the existing networks are not so established. Everybody needs people in this time and everybody's reaching out. So I can come in from the cold a little bit and not be a fifth wheel. Uh, now I gave up on the AMNH community this year as they s decided to take a stance on statues that I find unacceptable. Uh, so I'm letting my leadership la uh, lapse and I'm going to find other institutions that don't and won't do that. Um, but I, I should find ways to get into a physical community, uh, I mean an in-person community uh, or two of some sort again. I haven't decided which and I'm unsure how to do that, but I, I think this is one of those things where you realize that the status quo of your life is not what you want and it's not working out for you emotionally. Um, uh, I've been a little frustrated with some online communities I'm in change as they get bigger because personal ties disappear as the producers become stars and get fans, can easily corrupt the personality of hosts, but at best, they just don't have time for personal ties. Uh, I've had friends in the past who started to get a little bit famous and then they, they never had any time to hang out anymore. Um, and this is always a loss. Um, 
but COVID has given me some impetus to improve some things in my life. Now, finally, as a, as a big topic that I've been thinking about very recently, probably over the last week, I wonder and worry about the twilight of cosmopolitanism and the gentleman scholar. And while I think the latter may be one of the rare cases where I think a new name is warranted, I think the concept is still worth preserving. There's a certain confident wittiness, comfortable scholarship and mastery of facts and calm reason that I saw when growing up and that I aspired to, um, that I worry that the present era is no longer holding as an ideal uh, because poor reason, recrimination, and a new pur uh, puritanism on, uh, growing in some parts of the left and the rest of us, both left and right, are called on to combat it, makes it hard to have this kind of joviality and, and comfort needed for cosmopolitanism and and gentlemen scholars to to really work um and I, as i said i aspired to this when i was young and i snuck in when i felt i didn't really belong until slowly i came to feel that i did belong and i worry about its absence and the lack of its echoes and how society sees the world because it, it used to be an influential ideology it, it still exists but it's no longer dominant uh, or even particularly prominent. Um, but I, I hope that once the woke nonsense fades from the left and we relearn that radicals on both the left and the right rarely produce uh, changes of uh, that are valuable. And so we put those ideas back on the margins. I'm hoping after that, that, uh, that these can be reconstructed. But I, I worry a bit that some things have an unlikely origin and we're lucky that they came about, but just removing the cause of their diminution is not enough to restore them. But we'll have to see. Uh, and I, I think society, one of the trends I've seen is that you, ha you often have new terrible ideas wash in and they start to catch on and then people learn to argue against them and they start to see their problems. And I, I believe and hope that this is happening with the Wokes, but maybe the next problematic uh, set of ideas will, will come in whenever this one fades away. Maybe we'll always have uh, the, the barbarians uh, rumbling somewhere just, just past the horizon and we'll always have to worry about them uh, swooping in uh, to mess up everything we hold dear. We'll find out. Uh, in any case, this has been uh, 2020. I'm hoping we don't have more bad surprises this year. If there are any topics you wanna to hear more about, uh, any clarifications you want, um, uh, drop me a comment or drop me an email. And it's, it's nice just to sometimes be pushed to, to write the things that I might not write myself or things where I think maybe I've already written about them, but I'm not sure. If, if somebody asks about something, then uh, I feel like I don't have to worry about repeating myself endlessly. Um, and I, I'll just do it uh, if I'm interested in it because I won't have an opinion on everything, but I do have a lot of opinions. Anyhow, uh, this has been 2020 and I'm signing out. Bye.